Uh, thank you everyone for coming to my talk, Cooperative Economics for Engineers. Uh, there we go. Uh, or why you have more in common with pirate fleets than with your manager. Uh, so to give you a chance to leave if you need to, just as a content warning, I'll be talking a little bit about religion, uh, a little bit about death, because you know, pirates, uh, but also slavery and racism. So if that's gonna be an uncomfortable topic for you, you have ample opportunity to leave before then. Uh, some bookkeeping notes. Uh, I'm actually not going to be taking uh, questions. If you want to talk to me about this, uh, come to the open space instead. I've actually put it up on the board already. Um, also, uh, I'm gonna tweet these slides as well as some links to some interesting organizations. That'll happen immediately, but there's going to be a video of this and that'll be available later. <clears throat> hey, uh, Michael, could I uh, get the water over there? Sure. Thank you. All right, uh, so just uh, some other bookkeeping disclaimers. Uh, I work at Quantopian, but these are all my opinions. They're not the company line. Thank you. Uh, I am also an SRE professional. Please do not take anything that I say as investment advice. It's not. Okay, so hi, I'm James, and I'm getting over some bronchitis, so I might cough a lot. Uh, I'm a site reliability engineer working in finance. I've previously worked in academia, I've done uh, criminal justice work, I've worked in sales, just kind of all over the map. And uh, I wanted to start this presentation with a picture of my house. That's what it looks like, I just live up in Malden, so I just took the orange line to get here. Um, and you see, one of the things I'm really passionate about in life is cooperative housing and intentional communities. Um, that actually started when I got to Boston. I rented in some places with friends for like six or so years across three different co-ops. That means we do things like cooking together as a group, splitting all of our groceries, investing in furniture together. And you know, I liked it enough that I just decided that idea of, oh, I wanna go buy a house and have all my friends live in it. Well, I just did that. There's uh, seven of us, four cats and two snakes right now, but we're gonna be expanding. Um, and that works really well for me. I really follow that area pretty closely. And uh, as you can imagine, the people who are into cooperative housing are into some other stuff. And one of those other things they're into is labor organizing. There's actually a pretty close relationship between these groups. Now I wanna ask you all a question. Who has a laptop that looks like that? R raise your hands, okay? Now, if you had your hand raised, raise your hand if it has a union sticker on it. I don't see a single hand in the audience. But that's what a construction worker's helmet looks like, right? They have stickers all over the place and they're mostly union stickers. In fact, if you asked on a workplace, that might actually be a unanimous show of hands. So why is tech different? Well, it's actually not just unions. Uh, there's all sorts of different forms of organizing labor or having labor happen cooperatively or as a collective. And tech workers kind of don't do any of them. It's not just unions. But in 2019, we're really starting to see some signs of that changing. Uh, after years of crunch and deadlines and abuse from management, uh, workers in the gaming industry are actually starting to walk out, starting to really take seriously the idea of forming game development unions. Uh, employees at Google, they have you know, much better working conditions, but they're still facing harassment inside the workplace, and they actually had a major walkout over both that and uh, as well as Google's military contracts. Uh, in fact, this has been ongoing. After the walkout, there has been so much political discussion inside of Google that Google tried to tell employees to stop talking about politics at work, which is actually illegal, so the government had to come in and tell them not to do that. Um, we may not think of these as tech, but uh, a lot of these new media establishments, actually they are really tech companies that happen to do journalism, and some of them are starting to unionize as well. Uh, so there's BuzzFeed, uh, and there's also Vox. And uh, really close to home, NPM, they actually had a unionization drive, and uh, they lost several uh, senior engineers to firings there as a result of this, and then many more quit in solidarity. They've also lost, uh, I think, their CEO at this point. Uh, so it's been an ongoing struggle. Uh, just before I started working on the slides, this happened at Kickstarter as well. So there have actually been some Kickstarter projects that were like midway through funding and to show solidarity with the fired union members, they actually pulled off of Kickstarter and switched to competitors like Indiegogo. Um, in California, we have kind of the other side of this. So we see the things that are internal to tech companies, but they see, okay, what's a tech company like Lyft or Uber doing to the 
economy for people who are not programmers. And they decided they don't actually want to have an economy where people are just contractors with no benefits. Um, so they've passed a law that really changes the game for these gig uh, economy employees, which Uber is trying to contest. They're saying they're actually not in the business of driving, by the way. Um, and one that may be a little closer to home for some folks. Um, there have been a lot of organizations uh, talking about the role of tech in the concentration camps on, along the border. Um, Palantir has gotten a lot of attention for this because they're producing the information architecture that's helping ICE find specific people to deport, try and guess where they're going to be, where their family is going to be. So they're facilitating this. And they faced a lot of protest. It's actually to the point where a lot of students at the higher tier schools are actually saying, out of school, when we have our choice of jobs, we refuse to work with Palantir. We're not even going to consider them. Amazon has also faced a lot of criticism over this because a lot of the backbone that the uh, ICE is using, the technological services, they're all hosted on AWS. That was all from 2019. There was almost nothing like this in previous years. There were some smaller stories, but the idea that we have story after story after story of really big labor movements happening in tech is actually something pretty new and pretty interesting. So I see this as kind of the beginning of the end of the status quo. Um, you know, a lot of people in tech think of themselves as not political or they're not involved in causes. And I think society is actually saying, well, you don't have that option anymore. Even if you choose to be non-political, we're gonna make your job political. So the question is, what is tech labor going to look like in the future? Is it going to look like uh, someone working on a construction site with a union stickered hard hat? Are we just gonna put more stickers on our laptops? I kinda don't think so. I don't think that's the way that tech is going to go. But to really understand what it might look like, I wanna take a look at history and see what various labor movements in history have looked like. Because the answer is it's actually not always been unions. They're a fairly modern uh, invention. So, if you really like history, just cover your ears for the next 10 minutes. I'm gonna get a lot of stuff wrong because I'm trying to compress about 2,000 years into like 10 minutes. So you might think that I would actually start with this guy, if you know who he is. Um, but he's, he's like 10 minutes away. <laughs> we're, we're starting here, actually. We're gonna start in Rome. This is the Roman Empire at the peak of its borders, one of the largest empires the world has ever seen. They built marvels that last to this day. Well. Sort of, they didn't build them, their slaves built them. Uh, see, the Roman Empire at peak was something like 30% slaves, uh, and the types of slaves differed. There's argument about like how badly they were treated, but ultimately they didn't want to be doing those jobs. So there were occasional slave revolts, and sometimes what this would look like is effectively an entire city falling to slaves. So I'm not talking about the slaves refusing to work, I'm talking about the slaves raiding the city, seizing all the armaments, forming a standing army, and marching on neighboring cities. That's what a slave rebellion looked like in Rome. They really didn't like them. There was a lot of uh, popular uh, media that portrayed the idea of a slave revolt as something awful to society. Um, it was very ingrained that uh, the slave resistance was illegitimate. The thing with an empire that big, though, is um, it took weeks for news to cross something like that, even if you used a courier. So it's really hard to have uh, empire-wide movement. So most of these slave rebellions were one city at a time. The army would come, put them down. So they kept happening, uh, but they weren't a threat to the stability of the whole empire. What did end up being a threat, in some ways, was actually early Christianity. So uh, around uh, 1 CE, that's what religion looked like in the Roman Empire. And actually, you can see there were a lot of different religions that were very popular. Christianity hadn't actually spread very far. Um, so the Roman Empire was actually really used to the idea of there being multiple religions. Um, that's not why uh, the Roman Empire came out against Christianity in some ways. It actually has more to do with the doctrine. Um, because in the Roman Empire, you were allowed freedom of religion as long as you acknowledge that the Roman government was essentially the highest actor. Uh, and that was something that Christianity did not agree to. And that's what made it more of a threat. Because it said that people were equally worthwhile whether you were a slave or an emperor. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, so in response to this kind of doctrine, what did those emperors do? Well, they actually converted. Um, the Roman emperors switched over to Christianity and made that the state religion instead. 
It was sort of a co-optation of this existing social movement that was very popular with the lower classes. They feared that slave revolt would become more common as a result of this, so they kind of cut it off at the past before it became a real revolutionary movement. So did it work? Yeah, not really. Uh, there's a post-mortem if you want to read about it. <laughs> but we're going to skip ahead to uh, about the 700s through 1400s, uh, what's commonly known as the Middle Ages. You might know them as the Dark Ages. It's a misnomer. They're called that because there isn't much historical documentation from that period, so it was dark, uh, not because it was particularly like depressing times. So in the Middle Ages in Europe, your Roman vassal, the parts of this vast empire, they become independent kingdoms. They've converted to Christianity. Uh, Catholicism is a major power. Uh, and labor relations really look different. Uh, you see, it's not a Roman emperor uh, controlling land. Uh, it's not uh, Republican officials. Um, it's actually like individual families start owning land. And it's based on labor relations that are like social ties, things like marriages or land ownership. So we call the system feudalism. And under the feudal system, most people were peasants. Uh, and most of those peasants were what we call serfs. And a serf was essentially a form of slavery, um, maybe not as brutal as some other forms that have existed, but you could still be bought and sold as part of the land that you were on, and you would pay rent to some lord just for the idea of existing. But not every peasant was a serf. Actually, there were a lot of uh, skilled craftspeople in this era. There really started to be innovations in metalsmithing and glassworking. And, you know, those workers, in today's terms, they worked at union shops. They had what were called guilds. Medieval guilds were sort of like a predecessor to what we consider a union today. They would take you in at late childhood. They would train you. They would have very clear goals of what you need to do to open your own shop, what kinds of training you needed to get. Um, and they would also take care of you. If you got sick, uh, they would pay your bills. If you died, uh, they would actually take care of your family. Um, so they were like a cooperative society of people who are all in the same trade together. There were also local institutions. This is how some medieval cities got really well known for one type of industry. Like, oh, this is the city where we do all of our mirror making or glass blowing because they had these strong uh, local development organizations. And these guilds also self-regulated. Because they ran on the reputation of their craftspeople, you had to mark all of your goods as being made from this particular guild, this particular craftsperson. Uh, and if you sold bad goods, uh, your guild would actually take you to account. See, there wasn't a modern legal system. There weren't police officers at this time in history. So you really were just accountable to other craftspeople in your industry, in your town. Uh, and that's how people made quality goods in that era. And that's how uh, the technology started increasing. So at the same time that these craftspeople are laying the foundation for the Industrial Revolution, well, they're making all these high quality crafts and they have to sell them somewhere. So they turn to merchants. And those merchants start trading more goods, they start trading more interesting goods, and they start trading them farther away. So there starts to be much more of a system of international commerce. So they don't know it yet, but they're inventing the technology that will lay the groundwork for capitalism. And if I say technology, you might think, Oh, ships or wagons, like what was it? Was it sailing ships? It was actually social technology. It's contract law. So this is the era that we really get the modern idea of contract law from. Uh, this is uh, what's known as uh, Lex Mercatoria or merchant, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the law of merchant, which is the same sort of phrase as like inspector general or heir apparent. It is the set of laws dealing with merchants. Um, and when I say laws, it was actually a little less formal than that. Um, it was a set of agreements between various merchants about how they would conduct themselves and what they would do if there was some set of disagreement. And it was actually international. You see, at this time in Europe, uh, these kingdoms weren't very powerful or centralized, so you were doing trading with all sorts of different, even independent cities was pretty common in that era. And what made it work was that this was like industry self-regulation. All of these merchants had an idea of what they wanted uh, competition to look like, what they thought was fair, what they thought was unfair. And if you sought recourse, it was your peers who were judging you. Because of that, there was a strong incentive for everyone to collaborate on this system, to come up with newer and better rules, and to standardize them. So even if you were in England and your goods were in what would become Turkey, you could still get recourse for someone screwing you over and trading over there. And you'd have a good idea of how the system would work. 
So if you think that this like self-governing contract law thing sounds a little bit like open source licensing, you know, there's some similarities there. So during the Middle Ages, we had these really cool self-governing commerce systems from two separate like groups of industry, and they really drove us to this modern system of capitalism. So why don't we have them today? You know, you don't see people in guilds anymore. Well, before the Renaissance, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, we began to see a process of increasing control. What happened is these merchants were so successful that they started thinking of ways to get more tariffs out of them, more taxes. What's a good way to do that? Have a border. What do you have to have to have a border? You have to have a centralized nation. Um, so we really started to invent nationalism in this era, era, colonialism. It spread all across the world. It devastated ecosystems. It led to slavery and genocide. So, you know, a lot of people weren't very happy with this. And if you weren't, fuck it, become a pirate. <laughs> you see, piracy was really high risk in this era, but it was also really high reward. It was actually kind of the closest thing to a startup in that era. A lot of merchants traveled the world, and some of those merchants would be commissioned to attack other merchants. They would become privateers. Some of them would then freelance from there and just become full-on pirates, attack anyone. In some cases, the merchants would get captured by the pirates, see how much fun the pirates were having and how much they were making, and just decide to go into piracy. Some of those converted pirates then became uh, pirate captains of their own. There's uh, historical records of like specific people this happened to. But it wasn't just merchants. Uh, the world had moved on from peasant levies and knights, so now we had standing armies, and there were deserters from them. There were slaves in the Caribbean, both of black people and indigenous people, and many of those people, if they, they escaped, would turn to piracy because they, there they could stay free. Uh, and if you were a queer person, well, the church had kind of cracked down in Europe and there wasn't the Bay Area yet, so why not try international piracy? <laughs> so you had a lot of people that needed to work together on these pirate ships, all different walks of life. And there was already a cool system for this, contract law. You see, all these merchant ships used the law merchant to have a contract of everyone on that ship agreeing what they were going to do, what they were going to get paid, how long they were going to stay on the ship. Now, as an aside, look at the very top. I don't know if you can read that. The port that this ship is coming from is Providence in the colony of Rhode Island. I don't know if you can read where it's going to. It's Africa. This is actually the charter from a slave ship. Uh, slavery was a huge deal in New England. We didn't have as many slaves physically present here, but we were the power brokers and traders of slavery. Now, because so many pirates had previously been involved with merchants, they knew about these uh, ship's codes. So they adopted them and became pirate codes. Same sort of deal, but they would also govern your share of the treasure. And as it turns out, uh, those shares are actually pretty generous, right? Like, I think your CEO is probably making more than one and a half times of what you're making. No golden parachutes either, because actually, if a pirate ship got captured, the crew could sometimes wiggle out of it and say, oh, the pirates captured me, I had to do their bidding. The captain got hanged. No golden parachutes. Pirates also had a right to vote. In some ways, pirate ships were the most democratic institution of this time. We didn't have modern concepts of democracy yet. Also, uh, pirates were really good to their contracted employees. They actually gave them health care. If you lost a limb, uh, you would get compensated an amount that had been predetermined. This is the reason why so much pirate media in popular culture has peg legs and eye patches and hook hands, because they were the least shitty people to disabled people among them. And if you're one of those people who complains about codes of conduct at events like this, pirates have you beat by 400 years. <laughs> so the golden age of piracy did end. We do still have pirates today. They're not the most democratic institution in the world anymore, unless you count the pirate party. Back in Europe, the Industrial Revolution had started. It brought prosperity to a lot of people, but it brought misery to others. Uh, and many of our modern labor movements really draw their origins from the Industrial Revolution. One of the first groups, or one of the first well-known groups of organized resistance were the Luddites. And they have a really bad reputation. You usually think of Luddite as an insult. That's what you call someone who's too stupid to know how to use a phone. But that's not really who the Luddites were. They were actually skilled craftspeople, the same kinds of people who would have joined guilds in the medieval era. Uh, and everyone in their town needed their skills. Uh, rich and poor, y'all needed clothes. 
So the new looms that were being brought into these factories, they were known as uh, stocking frames. Um, if you look closely, you see what those things are? They're punch cards. These were the predecessors to modern computers. The first computer program ever written by Ada Lovelace was for the analytical engine, which would have been one of these with just some conversions to make it better at doing math. So the Luddites figured this stuff out quickly. They, they weren't idiots when it came to technology, but what they figured out is that the factory owners were the only people who would benefit from this, that all of their jobs would be at risk, that it would be lower quality goods, harsher working conditions, that they would lose the control and status in their communities because of it. So they smashed them. Um, it didn't take long for factory owners to start smashing back. And that started with like, your factory owner would just shoot you for destroying that and he'd get away with it. Um, but then they started turning to the government. They made up this new crime called frame breaking. Uh, and frame breaking actually at some points was a capital offense to destroy this machine because it was seen as so critical to England's economic development. So in a lot of ways, frame breaking parallels computer crimes legislation in the United States. Just very wide reaching legislation making something highly illegal because it's in the interest of economic development. We've seen the same thing happen to railroads. We've seen the same thing happen to oil pipelines. There are just higher penalties if you do a protest at an oil pipeline because it's seen as threatening America's infrastructure. And I would expect within 10 years, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already, to see legislation along these lines targeting cloud systems or AI systems, making it specifically illegal to interfere in their operation. And if you've been following what's been happening with the uh, Chef um, and Ice Connection, the revocation of the uh, gem from Ruby Gems, well, a lot of people have applauded Seth for doing this, for taking this gem down and preventing people from using it. I want you to consider, um, what about a future where this would end up carrying a prison sentence? Because that's actually the historical norm. It is ahistorical that you can do this and not get in trouble. So the Luddites were just one of many movements during the Industrial Revolution. And uh, as it progressed, we started to see something like modern nations. And during these uh, poor working conditions, living in cities, you started to see um, a lot of political philosophy. And Karl Marx is one of the most prominent authors in this era. And one of the misunderstandings is this idea that Marx like, is un-American or that Marxism is un-American. Guy actually corresponded with Abraham Lincoln once, uh, congratulated him for being against slavery because Marxists were against slavery. Uh, so he actually knew a lot about America. And Marx's legacy was um, to introduce the world to the idea of economic classes as something you could study, and economic classes as something that would fight against each other for their interests. So I'm not gonna talk about revolutionary Marxism, so this, this guy's not appearing. Um, but I'm gonna talk about what other people did with it, which was unionism. That's really when unionism started kicking off, once you had the idea of class struggle. Uh, and we remember unions because they gave us the eight hour work day. They gave us an end to uh, child labor. Uh, they gave us the five day work week. But we often don't remember what unions had to do to get there. See that? That's what union marches used to look like. If you've ever been a picket line now, it doesn't look like that. Because for a long time, you actually had no legal right to join a union. Um, and that meant unions had to take pretty extreme actions. They had to conceal their membership. They had to destroy property. They had to physically beat people trying to cross picket lines rather than just uh, shouting at them. Um, they were actually very violent organizations in some way because they were fighting for a cause that they believed in. They didn't want their children to die in the mines. But it's also important to note that unions were in many ways very racist and exclusionary organizations. Also, I just kicked over my water, oops. Um, so this is actually a historical document with unions backing the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, just a, a racist anti-immigrant piece of legislation. Uh, unions made a lot of compromises like these with power, and that's why we still have them today, um, because they got less and less radical as they got more and more integrated with society. So because unions have been so weakened and siloed and have lost wide membership, a lot of people don't trust them anymore. Well, it was pretty easy to have tech not have any unions from the start. It's much cheaper to fire a spreadsheet or an independent contractor than a white collar worker. But labor history isn't just about Marx. It's also about anarchism. Uh, that's actually where we get the modern cooperative movement, the same type of cooperative that I'm doing with my house. So we have producer cooperatives. 
Interestingly, Ocean Spray is a producer cooperative. It's a worker-owned organization. They don't advertise it as much, but anytime you're buying cranberries from them, it was produced by people in a cooperative. And you have consumer cooperatives. So if you've ever been to the Harvard Coop, uh, it's actually the Harvard Cooperative Society, and it was founded for students to buy cheap textbooks. So we haven't actively suppressed uh, software development cooperatives in the same way, but they're also not widely available. So you know, there's no cooperative you can join as an open source developer uh, to get money anytime someone uses your software. That just doesn't exist as a concept. And to a great degree, this is the way that the owners of tech companies want it. Because the owners of tech companies aren't just anti-union, they're also anti-protest, anti-boycott, anti-worker ownership. Like here's the CEO of Wayfair here in Boston saying, we don't want political employees, we're going to try and screen them out. Definitely gonna be a lawsuit over that. I added this slide while I was in the audience. Uh, that's why it's a phone screenshot. Uh, Domino's is actually launching this incredibly expensive campaign to go all the way to the Supreme Court to say we don't have to be accessible to blind people on our website. It's not because of the cost, the lawyers are much more expensive. They're doing this because they don't want to be forced to do that. They want to have control and say, we don't care about these people. So I'm not going to tell you which organization to join, which book to read. Really, the first step in labor organizing isn't reading a particular book. You don't have to read the Communist Manifesto. The first step is understanding that you are a worker, that workers have fought for their rights and needs, and that maybe your own rights and needs aren't being met. So the next time you sign an offer letter, think about whether you're getting a worse share of the treasure than a pirate. Next time you sign up for an app, think about who it's putting out of business and whether you'd help them if they decided to smash servers. And the next time you think of a coworker fired without explanation, think about if they'd been in a guild, would they still have health care? And most importantly, if your employer is unethical and you want help changing jobs, reach out. I know dozens or hundreds of people would be happy to help you. So I'll leave you with the words of the beloved uh, anarchist and science fiction author, Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, she actually gave this talk at a publisher's um, conference uh, while, where she was receiving an award uh, because those publishers were making a deal with Amazon to undercut the profits of their authors. So she said that to that audience of these people actively undercutting her. And I hope you'll understand that's a deal with Amazon, right? So it's not just about capitalism. It's also about tech. I hope you read these words and take them to heart. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have all these slides up on Twitter as long as some cool links to other organizations. And again, if you wanted to talk about this afterwards, come to the open space, which I think is at 2 o'clock. Thank you all very much.